Ooh. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Give me a one minute to go live on YouTube. Um, but obviously, for live attendees, you get to uh, engage with us directly. Um, one second. OK, we're good Ooh. to go. We're good to go. OK. Hi, everyone. I'm Jenny Chen. I'm the founder of 3D Heels. Um, I founded 3D Heels about six years ago now. I can't believe how long that was. And uh, with the intention to network, educate, and connect innovators and early adopters in the space of healthcare 3D printing and bioprinting, uh, we used to organize a lot of in-person events. And uh, because of pandemic, now we're focusing on virtual experiences. And down the line, we will also focus on hybrid experiences. So today we're gonna to add a new feature to our webinars is after all the presentations, we will do a breakout room. I will share the link of the breakout rooms um, in, in the chat box, so stay tuned for that. And uh, so after all the presentations and the, the webinar, we can join and meet people in person. So I hope that's fun. Now, meanwhile, if you have any questions for the speaker, make sure you enter your question in the QA box um, and if you have a specific question for any particular speaker, make sure that you address to them so that people know. Obviously, all the panelists are free to answer them. Uh, we will answer most questions live. Uh, however, if we have too many questions, we will uh, also just type in answers as well. Um, also, for all the attendees who are joining us, feel free to uh, enter your name, where you're from, what you're looking for in the chat box. So it's a bit of a a social as well. I mean, it's not like in person, but I think we're all getting used to how to interact with one another in a virtual space. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's event, um, actually. I think um, if you want to successfully create a bioprinted organ or tissue or even 3D cell culture for pharmaceutical research, it is now well known that we need to get the bio ink correct. However, this is not an easy job. And so that's why we invited world-class experts today who have decades of experiences in science and entrepreneurship to share with us how to make it work. What is the secret recipe? Um, obviously, um, I already told all the speakers don't really actually share their secret recipe, but actually just share what their perspectives on what potentially could work, um, share their knowledge, experiences, and uh, and business cases. So the first speaker I want to introduce is Professor Stephanie Wellerth. I'm getting my cheat sheet here. I, I know Stephanie for many years. Um, she holds a Canada Research Chair in Biomedical Engineering at the University of Victoria, where she has dual app appointments in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and the Division of Medical Sciences as Associate Professor. She is a leader in many different organizations um, and also uh, wrote a book on engineering neural tissue using stem cells. Um, but late, the latest leadership role that she took, up, uh, she took on is as the CEO and co-founder of Oxalodo Biosciences, uh, which is a bio ink startup. Um, so Stephanie, I'll let you take away. Awesome. Well, yeah, thanks so much, Jenny. Um, very excited to be here and um, tell you a bit about um, our bioinks and what we've been up to both here at the University of Victoria and um, with Axolotl. And um, I actually am a full professor these days, uh, which is exciting. Um, yeah, so for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm uh, Dr. Stephanie Willerth and I'm at the University of Victoria. So we're um, north of Seattle, west of Vancouver. And as things begin to open up, we always uh, welcome people to come visit. Um, and I do have very fond memories. We threw a really fun 3D Heels event um, like three months before the pandemic <laughs> ended the world. And um, one of the things that's really exciting about my lab and that makes it a bit different from other organizations um, is we actually have a lot of 3D bioprinters. And so uh, one of the things our group has been really uh, lucky is that we've been able to actually compare how bioinks work on different platforms because um, as many of you may know or may not know, um, each 
bioprinting platform, you know, ranging from things that, you know, there's lots of different ones. Selling makes, we have both an incredible and a bio X, we have an Alepi one, we have one of the aspect biosystems RX ones. Um, when you're dealing with a bio ink, you really have to tailor it to your printer because they do have different ways of controlling their pressures and flow rates. And so that's something that we've been, been very good at and, and seeing how it compares when we use our different bio inks on these different systems. So um, before I get into that, um, I'm pretty sure everyone knows what 3D bioprinting is, but uh, just to quickly review, um, essentially just similar to traditional 3D printing, you know, you start with your CAD design file that you want to make. Um, and then in bioprinting, instead of extruding a plastic filament into this shape or metal, um, you actually use specialized bio inks, which contain cells. Um, and you, this gets printed into your desired shape, you then can culture them to get functional tissues. And then uh, as Jenny mentioned, some of the real challenges comes in is getting a bio ink that is both printable and will preserve the function of your cells. And our lab has been uh, really effective at making a bio ink that supports um, stem cell viability. And if you're interested in learning more, our lab has written a lot of review papers on this. And this uh, review you see at the bottom, we actually wrote with the guys from Aspect on how you can use 3D bioprinting to make healthy and disease models of brain tissue. Um, I think probably if you're attending this, you're probably a fan of 3D printing. Um, our lab started doing this, I think, in 2016 in collaboration with Aspect. But when, some of the reasons we were really keen to get into bioprinting, and I'm sure Ali can talk about this as well, um, it really provides a, a rapid and reproducible way to make uh, tissues as opposed to some of the old ways we used to make them. When I was in grad school, we would make them sort of manually and shake and you know pipette things into 24 wool plates and then manually shake them to get 24 constructs. Um, on a good day, um, our lab can print 100 constructs using the BioX and the Aspect systems. Um, with some of the more expensive bioprinters like the Aspect Biosystems RX1, you can actually make some really complex tissue structures as well. Um, but given the control you can have over where you place cells. And I'll talk about it uh, in this talk a little bit as well, drug releasing microspheres. So you can potentially pattern some more complex things uh, than you would get with some of the more traditional tissue engineering methods. Um, so just some general considerations with bioprinting uh, and the supply would be something you'll hear a lot about today, which is why I'm excited to see both uh, Bowman from uh, Advanced Biomatrix here. Um, the choice of materials when you're making bio ink, because making something printable um, something materials that are usually the easiest to print aren't necessarily the best for keeping your cells alive, which is partially why we ended up spinning out axolotl biosciences is uh, we have an ink that's both printable and also really good at keeping stem cells alive and functioning. What cells you want to print, um, definitely there's things that are much easier to print like fibroblasts or cancer cells compared to uh, stem cells. The printer, uh, there's a lot of different bioprinters on the market with a lot of different uh, technologies. So that's another consideration. Um, the structure you actually want to print and then uh, incorporation of the differentiation factors, uh, especially if you want to keep your cells alive and functioning. Um, just to define what a bio ink is, uh, and this comes from this biofabrication paper you can see below, um, written by a lot of the different experts in the field as you can see with Jason Burdick, um, and Sheila Hellshorn and a bunch of other people, Jürgen Grohl um, out of Germany. So a formulation of cells suitable for processing by an automated biofabrication technology that also contains biologically active components and biomaterials. And as I mentioned, um, bioinks tend to be hydrogel-like in structure as opposed to filaments, which is what you'll see if you're you know, running your traditional 3D printers um, at home, your Ultimakers and things like that. And if you wanna learn more about naturally derived biomaterials, um, Claire uh, and Becca, Josie um, from my lab put together a really nice review on natural biomaterials and their use as bioinks. And for those of you who, who aren't in academia, the nice thing about bioengineering is this is open access, so anyone can read it. So uh, what makes a structure printable? And this sort of goes to the heart of what a bioink is. Uh, as I mentioned, this can vary uh, between the bioprinters, just given the different ways they control um, the methods. And I'll, I'll get into that for the different printing systems in a second. Um, you really are concerned a lot with the properties of the bioink, like the viscosity. Uh, how are you going to actually get your ink to go from being a liquid to a solid? Because it's usually chemical cross-linking. You can also use light to cross-link and things like that. Uh, our lab has found a lot, especially when you're working with these bioinks, um, the pattern in which you print the structure is really important, um, the complexity of design, and then also keeping your cells alive. 
And often in our lab, we'll do, if we're going to print a new structure, we'll um, do a test print where we use some of our cheaper materials. And um, we often use uh, different dyes to enable visualization of the structure to see that we're getting what we want um, when making our structures. Although I do know some of the 3D printing companies out there are working on software and sort of AI methods to predict whether or not a structure will be printable. Uh, here's just again some, some reviews of the different types of printing out there. Um, some of the 3D bioprinting evolved from inkjet printing where you either use thermal or acoustic forces to secrete your um, cell aid and bio inks into your defined um, shape. It can also be done using lasers where laser pulses are what distributes out your, your cell aid and bio inks. Um, most of the things I'll talk about today are uh, different forms of these extrusion printing where you're using either air or mechanical force to extrude out um, your cells in bioink. And I will point out that often with bioinks, especially those like ours that have chemical cross-linking, you often need a second channel to provide that cross-linker. Uh, there's also some things where people will print their structures and then put them in a bath of the cross-linking agent as well to ensure more stability. And uh, electrospinning has been modified as well to, as a form of 3D printing, where you uh, apply a heavily, uh, highly charged voltage field and it draws out these thin strings um, of your polymer containing your bioink. And again, if you want to read more, um, both our lab and then the collaboration with Benata Jodar's group out of UTEP, um, we published some really nice reviews. And uh, the one from Cellular Molecular Bioengineering in 2018 was actually, I think, the most uh, read paper for the year for that journal. So um, if you're really looking to make a lot of different types of tissues from stem cells, it's really got a lot of good info in it. Um, as I mentioned, one of our close collaborators, uh, Aspect Biosystems, who are a 3D bioprinting company across the way in Vancouver, who we've been collaborating with for six years. And, and this year, we just took home the top um, University of Victoria Award for our research partnerships. They have these really interesting microfluidic print heads. And I know Ali's group also has a lot of experience and expertise um, with this as well. And so this gives you more channels for when you're playing with both your bio ink and printing your structure. As you can see with the sort of food coloring here, you've got these, um, this case it's sort of two channels and a cross linker channel. Um, they've expanded their product line. So they do have six channels now as well. Um, and essentially you can see sort of the bio ink hits the cross linker and that's when it polymerizes and extrudes out as a fiber. And some of the nice things about the aspect system is um, given that it's microfluidics, we can control the flow rate. And so it's uh, a much gentler system on our stem cells um, compared to some of the other systems. Um, one of the, uh, and this has been published in ACS Biomaterial Science and Engineering, and it's one of the methods of the year paper. Um, we have a novel fibrin based bio ink that um, fibrin is. Uh, derived from blood. And so it's a purified version of fibrin we've used and made printable by adding small uh, small amounts of alginate and chitosan to our, our ink. And so, and then you cross-link it using the enzyme thrombin and calcium chloride. And so this is sort of how our ink works in the context of the aspect printer, where you have these multiple channels and they get coaxially extruded into structures. And some of the nice things about our ink, um, which I think we first pu published back in 2018, um, is you can get, it, it really promotes uh, high levels of neuronal cell survival when you're printing them derived from um, stem cells. And here are just some of our first structures we printed, which were discs and rings. And more recently, we've been printing domes. Um, but yes, yeah, so we, we essentially made a really good ink for printing these stem cell derived tissues. And we've been playing around with it since then to print a wide variety of things. This is also um, one of the products that Axolotl sells. And so we've been shipping our ink um, to, I think we've got 10 different academic beta testers. And it's also in beta with eight companies um, that are using it to print a wide variety of, of different types of tissue, including cardiac, um, blood vessels, skin tissue. And my favorite is um, our collaboration with the Prostate Center where they've used it to um, essentially print miniature versions of testes that produce sperm. Um, as I mentioned, uh, while all the published work that's out there has been with our fibrin-based bioink um, in, in being used in combination with the aspect system, uh, I think probably a lot more of you are, um, are likely to own, if you own a bioprinter, either the Alevi One or one of the Alevi family products or the Cellink products because they have a lot more market penetration. Um, so we did try versions of our ink, uh, which we did have to modify to print on these different systems. So the Alevi One, which is a very simple extrusion-based bioprinter, um, it, its main methods of uh, cross-linking are either heating up a material or using UV cross-linking when printing. 
So uh, when my group and my team at Axolotl wanted to print on it, they actually uh, 3D printed a coaxial print head that would enable us to extrude both a chemical crosslinker um, alongside our bio ink. Um, as I mentioned, another way you can do that is you can actually print your structure and then immediately submerge it into crosslinker or print directly into a crosslinker bath, which might work really well with, um, for those of you who are familiar with Adam Feinberg's group out of Carnegie Mellon and his company Fluidform. Fluidform's life support product is something that's really good for that. And in fact, we, we haven't used it yet, I don't think, but we do have some, uh, some life support in our lab that we're very excited to print into. Um, one of the things we found with the Alevi um, is that like the nozzles did tend to clog, which you do see pretty much on a lot of the different bioprinting systems. And one of the things our, our lab and the company have um, done a lot of work on is developing uh, solutions that you can use to sort of flush out your systems. That's why it's also uh, when you are printing, sometimes really helpful to use things like phenol red to visualize your tissues um, as well. Um, yeah, and so one of the things I found with the Alevi, in case anybody's working with it, is you um, usually want a more viscous version of our ink uh, to, to actually get it to print on these systems, given the control. Um, as I mentioned, we also have a Cell Ink Incredible, 